Good morning. Stand with us. Begin a time of praise. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Message of praise, the treasures of faith are never enough. You came along and put me back together.
Praise the Lord. Yes, take your seat. The Lord says in Psalm 99, the Lord reigns. Let the people tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the people. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is the Lord. Amen. If you're visiting with us today, we are grateful that you're here. Uh, grateful that you chose to be a part of this worship service. You could be anywhere today, but you're here. And there is a special treat, several treats throughout the course of this service that I think that you'll enjoy. We've been blessed and gifted all summer long by a series of teachers that are part of our church. And uh, somebody said, well, you know, when you're ready to retire, we already have the next replacement for you. I'm talking about Jeremy's message from last week. And, and, uh, and I heard that message, too, as I was sitting next to my brother and listening to the worship service and joining the time and um, listening to God's Word. And you've been hearing that kind of teaching throughout the summer. Uh, yes, there have been some Sundays I've taught, but you've been blessed with great teaching that has happened all summer long. A little bit later in the service, you're going to hear one of our other teachers, and that is Leo Hebert, who's been faithfully teaching God's Word here for many, many, many years. In fact, his family's here uh, with him. They're sitting somewhere back over here. And uh, where are you guys at? I'm sorry. Oh, they're back over there in the center. Okay. And uh, Jonathan and Scott, their families. And Jake's not here. Jake works for the Institute of Creation Research. And if you want to look at subjects like uh, global warming from a Christian perspective, understanding that, yeah, heady stuff. But certainly you want to go to icr.org, Institute for Creation Research. And uh, he does, he is on their faculty and he spends a great deal of his time lecturing and teaching. And from a Christian point of view, what it means certainly to live out our faith in this crazy world that's aspiring and espousing all kinds of ideas. So Leo will be coming to teach God's Word. He'll be teaching on spiritual gifts, and that will happen a little bit later on as we're looking at this summer series, and we're encouraging you to take notes. There will be plenty of notes, rest assured, in this message this morning. Take notes this summer. A little bit later on in the summer, we're going to do a recap, okay? So If you don't think I'm serious about taking notes, you might have to go back and listen to all these messages and take down what was the essence of what we were talking about when we talked about the the purpose of the church and speaking of the glory of God and the Word of God and the Spirit of God and now the giftings of the Spirit of God that we're going to look at this morning. Well, this week, let me tell you about some exciting things happening. Uh, Jillian Hunt has planned another exciting Vacation Bible School. Jillian, if you'll just raise your hand out there. Uh, we need more uh, cookies and candies, uh, whatever, snacks, right? I think uh, cookies, cookies, okay? Yeah, so please, make homemade cookies is what kids really like. <laughs> the store-bought, no, I mean, whatever you can produce, but anyways, homemade, healthy, of course. Right outside the door, there's a place for you to, to uh, uh, take a picture and to really try to put on social media uh, to put the word out there about Vacation Bible School. Families are looking for a great place to bring their kids. It will be a great learning environment. There is not another Vacation Bible School like this one because it was written by Jillian. And so uh, it is very unique as she's been doing the last several years. And so it's not out of a box, although that's okay. It's, it's really out of her creative heart. And we're grateful looking at the I am statements of Jesus that our, our children have been looking at for some time now. That'll be this, this week, okay? So um, I know I think I'm probably missing something else and it just escaped my mind. But we are, we are grateful. We have... Um, at the, as, as we conclude this announcement time, we have a special moment in the service. And so you can, you can tell a child is loved by the people who show up for their dedication, right? So today we're going to be dedicating uh, Gentry. And so Ethan and Kristen, if you'll come forward at this time. And uh, if you're with uh, Gentry's family, would you please stand up? Okay. Isn't this, isn't this great? Wow. Praise God. This is beautiful Gentry Lane Graves, and she was born August 5th of 2021, right? And um, this is Ethan and Kristen, mom and dad. And so we're going to dedicate her to the Lord. And inside, there's a little Bible, as we like to give to the children, okay? And then there's also her first book of theology. Yes, (laughs) learning about Jesus, and it's really helpful. 
to the adults as well, okay, just to let you know. But, um, I mean, what, what a joy. It's a beautiful family um, that uh, we're grateful they're a part of our young adult department here. And uh, uh, one of the bright spots in the life of our church is the growth of this department and what God's doing. And you are so beautiful. You know that? You are. You're still in the hearts of everybody. Let's, let's pray together. Father, we just want to lift up Gentry to you, Lord. She is beautiful. And we pray that all the beauty on the outside would just be um, totally in the, in the inside as she grows and develops and the sweet spirit of her mom and her dad will follow her. And Lord God, that you will fill her with your spirit. One day when she believes and she knows exactly who you are, Lord, and we pray that that'll be really early in her life, that Lord, she will know you in a great way and you will know her because you knew her even before the foundation of the world. Lord, you knew her even before she was in, in, in Kristen's womb. And we thank you for that reassuring word that we have. And so she's yours. We dedicate her and we as a church and her family. Lord, we commit ourselves to her growth and development spiritually, emotionally, physically, in every, in every way we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Love you guys here. Let me give this to you. And we're going to have a time of offering now. Brother Keith Carl gonna, is going to lead us, okay? All right, brother. Go ahead. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much this morning for uh, just the time to be together, Lord. And thank you so much for people that serve with the guy and the music uh, team and Brother Joe. Lord, we do ask you to be with him and his family and comfort him during this time of loss. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful little baby, Gentry, and thank you for this family, Lord, that came to uh, be here for this special occasion. Lord, we thank you for all you've given us, Lord, and we want to give a little bit back to you. And Lord, we ask you to bless this offering. We ask you to bless this service. We ask you to anoint this service and this teaching and this singing. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Stand with us as they pass the plate. We continue our time of prayer. It is well with my soul, let's sing together. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea below.
ever just had to be held? Have you ever, have you ever just been in a situation like that where you, you had to be held and you were by yourself? So who's going to hold you, right? And God says he can be there. He is there to hold you. Amen? We just have to acknowledge that. It's always us, really, right? It's because we don't realize that God is there in that moment to hold us. And we don't allow that. Matthew chapter 16 says this. That Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples this. He said, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say it's John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter, bold enough to say, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Amen. Jesus answered and said, blessed are you, Simon. Bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not re revealed this to you, but it's been my Father who is in heaven has revealed that. Praise be to God and bless the reading of his word. Amen. Christ be magnified in us. Let's sing together. Can you acknowledge that he is the Christ? Amen. That's what it's about. Were creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry, then from north to south and east to west, we hear Christ. Be magnified. Were the whole earth echoing his imminence, his name would burst from sea and sky, from rivers to the mountain tops. We'd hear cry.
be your prayer this morning. Christ be magnified. Let's sing it again. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my Christ be magnified in me. Amen. Father, thank you so much for your truth, for your comfort, Father, and for your grace. Now speak to us. Speak to us through Brother Leo, Father, and let's hear the word that you would have us here this morning in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated if you would. And the Newsom's had the children this morning, so if you would, let them down the aisle for their time of Bible study as well. Brother Leo, come bless us. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm grateful to be able to be here and um, appreciate your being here. And I want to thank Brother Joe for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. Um, as you probably know, there a, co a committee has been formed to uh, review our church governing documents, and the purpose for this uh, assembly of, and effort is to review our documents, our governing documents, to make sure that uh, we are in line with what the scripture says about how churches are to function, and if there's any gaps in there, if we've uh, left something out or over the years where things have gotten maybe twisted a little bit. Our purpose is to revise those documents and uh, get us more in line with how the scripture says churches are to function and operate. And a large part of that effort will be centered around spiritual gifts. And this is what I'm going to speak to you on this morning. So before we begin, let me open in prayer. And if you'll pray with me. <clears throat> Lord, thank you. Thank you so much for each day that you give us. Thank you for um, the gift of life. Uh, we realize that uh, uh, you are in control of that. We realize that we don't have a promise of tomorrow and uh, that we should live each and every day as if it were our last. So we pray your blessings upon uh, this effort this morning that as a result, we'll walk away with a little better idea of how spiritual gifts are to operate in not only in the church, but also in the life of the individual believer. So we ask all these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, I'd like to get started by uh, just defining, we're talking about spiritual gifts. We'll actually define what a spiritual gift is. We're going to talk about biblical things. It's important that we know the words that the Bible uses to describe these subjects. And the first uh, reference we're going to look at is 1 Corinthians 12, 7, which gives us the, uh, the definition of a spiritual gift. It reads like this, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now the word uh, gift is not used here, but uh, it's used in other places where spiritual gifts are addressed and the Greek word for that is charisma, which simply means a grace gift. But the, but the word in our verse this morning, manifestation, simply means an expression or bestowment. And in everyday language, if we were to describe this, it would be a divine enablement by the Holy Spirit. Now, that said, a divine enablement is not something uh, in this context, that's an ability. It's not innate. It's not something that we were born with. Only when we were born the second time, when we were converted through the faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, are these gifts given. It is a provision uh, for the New Testament believer by virtue of his position in Christ. Now that's the biblical definition of a spiritual gift. 
Uh, the next, by way of introduction, I'd like to also talk a little bit about their importance because um, uh, the importance has not always been, uh, in my opinion, properly stated by the church in general. Uh, it's, been, it's been understated, and, and when you look at uh, what the Bible says about it, it really is difficult to overstate their importance. Uh, one well-respected teacher has said that uh, it is, it is, there is no activity that a believer in Christ can engage in that's more important than the activity of a, of a spiritual gift. That's pretty, a pretty high bar, and uh, if that's true, well then the church should uh, act accordingly. Now, in order to explain or give the basis for why this importance uh, is, has been so stated by some. We're going to look at two passages of Scripture. The first one will be Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. And it reads like this, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, if you've been a, around Christians very long, you've heard a lot of preachers and teachers say that God has a plan for us. He does have a plan for us, but Ephesians 2, verse 10, is seldom used. It's always a passage from Jeremiah or, or Psalm 139 or other such places. But uh, Ephesians gives us a little, I think, a little better handle on the importance of why, uh, of why spiritual gifts are indeed as important as some say. Uh, this verse tells us four things. First thing it says is we are workmanship, or we are His workmanship. And this is the idea of fashioned artistry that is to look like something. Then the next thing we're, we're told is that we are created for good works. And these good works will achieve the Maker's purpose for just how we as New Testament believers are to look. And then the third thing is that uh, these works were prepared beforehand. That's before creation by God himself. And then the fourth and final thing is believers are to find these works and walk in them. So, our, so uh, by way of this uh, little, little expression that we read in this verse in Ephesians, these particular works that have been created beforehand by God himself actually becomes our plan for our lives. So how does this fit into this idea of, or the subject of spiritual gifts? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 11 tells us several things, but a, a one is that, uh, and I'll read the passage, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. I want to talk uh, Focus on the last part of that sentence, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. Now that means that a believer does not decide which gift he's going to get. That's decided by the Holy Spirit. Uh, now the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. He's co-equal with the Father and the Son, and that makes the Holy Spirit God. God is... Uh, uh, one and three, uh, three and one, one and three, we, we know that, we believe that, we don't understand it, but we believe that. And uh, since the Holy Spirit is God, since He is the Spirit of God, He knows the mind of God. And since He knows the mind of God, which gifts do you think He will impart to believers when their time comes? Well, I can tell you, he will absolutely give the spiritual gifts that match the works that were created beforehand that we are to find and walk in. So, when things are designed and fashioned for use, these things will only function properly if they are used according to their design. You may be aware of that, you may not be aware of that, if, but if you've ever tried to use something uh, that's contrary to the design, you probably will become very frustrated. It's not going to work correctly. Now, uh, we are creatures made by our Creator, and we too are designed for general purposes and also specific purposes. But we will also not function properly unless we function according to our design. 
And let me say that this design is in large degree determined by the works that were created beforehand that we're supposed to walk in. So, the spiritual health of individuals depends in large degree on just how closely we walk according to this design. And the church's health is nothing more than the sum total of all the individuals that make up the church, their spiritual health. So if the church is to be healthy, the individuals have to be healthy as well. And uh, this, as I said, this is true for the individuals and it's also true for the church. So the second passage of scripture I'd like to refer to is uh, Romans chapter 12. And just as in a general nature about Romans chapter 12. Um, Paul, when he wrote his doctrinal epistles, always began the epistles with doctrine. And then when he was through with the doctrinal part, he would talk about how to apply the doctrines that he had just explained. Romans is no different. It's set up in the same structure. Uh, the doctrinal part ends with chapter 11, and uh, the application part begins with chapter 12. And most of us are familiar with uh, how chapter 12 begins. Verse 1 begins with, present your bodies a living sacrifice. And then verse 2 talks about the renewing of your minds. Now, generally, we, we understand these verses as a general uh, uh, in, warning for, not a warning, but a advice for us on how we are to do certain things and why we should do those things. But um, the importance of it is what follows it, it, the context is in which these two gifts, uh, these two verses are given. The, the context is spiritual gifts beginning in verse 3 and going on through verse 8. Uh, we're not going to look at, the, at, at what all that says. We'll, we'll just briefly go through it a little bit later on. But the, the reason I'm bringing this up is because when Paul begins his part of this epistle that deals with application, the very first thing, a, a subject he addresses is that of spiritual gifts. And so in my opinion, that places it very high on the list of importance. And uh, as we will look a little bit later on, and we'll see, and I hope you'll see that when you read these passages, these verses that do deal with the spiritual gifts, the way they're worded is somewhat puzzling. But the, the, the reason that it is, is that what Paul is trying to tell us is that these particular gifts are to, to form a primary role in our lives as believers. And that's the way that, that's the reason for that kind of strange structure and when he talks about he didn't give much information on the gifts and the reason is, is it's not to impart a lot of information just to let his readers know how important this activity is to be <clears throat> now there are a lot of questions that come up when you think about uh, spiritual gifts and when that particular subject is discussed but uh, one question is that is any use of a spiritual gift beneficial or, prof or proper? In other words, you have the gift, can it be misused or can it be abused? And the answer to that question is yes. They can be misused and they can be abused. All you have to do is read the, the first epistle to the church at Corinth and that <clears throat> the major part of the information that Paul uh, dispenses there is that these Corinthian believers were really not using their spiritual gifts like they were designed to be used. So if, if that's true, if they, if they can be misused, uh, can they be removed? Will they be, be removed from the believer who's been given these particular gifts? Well, if any should have their gifts removed, it was the believers at Corinth, but they weren't. Uh, and we just looked at the definition of a spiritual gift, and it, we're told that it's the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And uh, these gifts were not re removed, we can conclude, because they remained in the body of Christ. The only way that a believer could lose his spiritual gift is to be removed from the body of Christ. And we know and we are convinced that simply will not happen. So what and where are the spiritual gifts found? Well, I've created a chart that will show you that, that's, uh, and that's based uh, on the, there are four groups of scripture that list all the spiritual gifts. Do we have the chart up there? 
Yes. So there you see in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, verses 8, 9, and 10, we have nine gifts listed. And um, there are no... Now, the way that these are listed, uh, did, they're not in any particular order. So there are repeats in these lists, but there are none in this one because this is the first one we're looking at. The second uh, group is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 28. And there we have eight spiritual gifts listed. Now, in this group, there are some repeats. There are four unique uh, gifts. The, the ones that are repeated are prophets, miracles, healings, and tongues. Those are the repeats. And in group three, uh, from Romans 12, verses 6, 7, and 8, we have seven gifts listed. Two are repeats there, prophecy and teaching. And then in group number four, uh, with the fourth and final group, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, we have four gifts listed. Two are unique, and the two repeats are apostles and prophets. So in summary, in these four groups, there are 28 uh, gifts listed, eight are repeats, so that leaves us with 20 unique spiritual gifts listed for us in the New Testament. Next question is, who gives the spiritual gifts? We've read that uh, uh, in one of the previous verses, but the next verse we'll look at is 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 11, which says it a little, which says it a little uh, more plainly, but one in the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. So the Holy Spirit is in charge of the spiritual gifts. He, he gives the gifts and he decides which ones will be given. Next question, when? Are spiritual gifts given? Well, let me say this in a general uh, sense. They're not given to the Old Testament saints. It's strictly, it's strictly a New Testament uh, gift. And uh, in, the old, in the Old Testament, we read about the Holy Spirit coming upon individuals to provide or to perform certain tasks. But as soon as that task was completed, well, then the Holy Spirit left that individual. He departed. It's not the same in the New Testament. Holy Spirit indwells the believer permanently, and the, when the gifts are given, they are also permanent as well. Now, conventional wisdom says the gifts are given at our conversion, and that's really hard to dispute, but there actually is no statement that tells us when they are given. Uh, it says that each believer is a recipient of a spiritual gift. Uh, next question, to whom are they given? Again, I'll refer to chapter uh, 12 of 1 Corinthians, verse 7, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So they're given to members of Christ's body, and that excludes Old Testament saints. And their purpose, as we just read uh, from 1 Corinthians, for the common good, another passage of Scripture uh, 1 Peter 4.10 that addresses spiritual gifts to serve one another. Uh, generally, uh, spiritual gifts are given for the edification of others. Some teach and, and, uh, and participate and, and believe that uh, some, these, some of these gifts are self-edifying. That's not the way they're designed to work. They're designed to edify others. You've been, given a, you've been given a spiritual gift for the purpose of building up another member of the body of Christ, and those other members have been given gifts for the purposes of edifying you. So they're not to be, ed they're not to be used to edify yourself. How many do we get? How many spiritual gifts do we get? Well, we get at least one. 1 Peter 4.10 says each one has received a gift, singular, a gift. However... 2 Timothy 1.11 tells us that Paul, the Apostle Paul, had three, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. So you either get one or you might uh, get more than one, but you'll get at least one. So um, when you read about spiritual gifts from um, uh, people that uh, write about this subject, you'll find categorizations of spiritual gifts and uh, that is a legitimate uh, uh, activity. I think it does us good to 
uh, categorize these gifts, uh, but there is a biblical basis for that, and we find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4, 5, and 6, where Paul writes, uh, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. And there are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. So these, uh, these categories, whenever you chart them out or when you look at the list of these gifts and you, and you visualize it, uh, this structure, the way God has designed these gifts to operate, they, they actually create a net of provision for the saints of the church, for their every possible need. Uh, there's not a need that you can have, a spiritual need that you can have as a, as a believer that a spiritual gift will not meet. Second Peter 1.3 reads like this. His divine power has granted to us everything, underline everything, everything per pertaining to life and godliness. So, spiritual needs will be met and satisfied by a spiritual gift. And this connects the dots back to why spiritual gifts are so important. This is how God's plan for your, life, uh, your lives is accomplished. So the second uh, chart that I have for you is uh, just to show some categories. This is a subjective way to, to divide up these gifts, and it's certainly not exhaustive. It's just one that I put together some years ago. But they only serve, these categories only serve as illustrations to provide how God has uh, uh, met, has planned to meet our needs as believers. But when you start to, when you sit down and you start to make a category, you read a category that somebody else has put together, you begin to see how these gifts overlap. And it's easy, it would be very easy to put one gift in more than one category. Now, uh, when you look down at the bottom of that list, you'll see um, sign gifts. And I want to say a word just about sign gifts because this is where, when we discuss spiritual gifts, this is where all the controversy is and this is where a lot of uh, disagreement exists and uh, uh, actually denominations have split over this issue. But there are six sign gifts. And uh, they're apostle, the gift of apostle, uh, speaking in tongues, prophecy, interpretation of tongues, healing, and miracles. Now, I want to say one thing. Now, now this talk this morning cannot look at these individual gifts. There's just not enough time to do it. It takes about 20 hours to go through the entire study. But I do want to make, a, a, make mention about one sign gift. And it has to do with this thing that's called apostolic success. One of the sign gifts is apostle, the gift of apostles. And some teach there is such a thing as apostolic succession. But uh, we know this, that Paul was the last apostle chosen and that John was the last apostle to die. And biblically speaking, there have been no apostles since then, and I'm going to try to show to you why I think that is true. Uh, Acts chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 tells us, several things, but among the things that this verse tells us, the two requirements to be an apostle, a biblical apostle, and I'll distinguish that with a capital A. When we read our Bible, it doesn't make that distinction. But the word apostle, just from the Greek language, simply means one who is sent with a message. That's what the word apostle means. But in order to be an apostle with a capital A, there's two requirements that you have to meet. You have to have seen the physically resurrected Messiah. That's, re that's requirement number one. And then you have to have been given a command. And that command that Jesus gave to these men, these apostles that he chose, was to be witnesses to his resurrection. And we know that when Matthias was uh, chosen to replace Judas in the group of apostles, the Bible tells us that he met those two resurrections. That's why he was in the group of candidates to be selected. But now the real reason why we can have no, no apostolic succession is Hosea chapter 5 and verse 15. 
is a prophecy, and it reads like this, I will go away and return to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. So this, this prophecy really has three, three phrases in it. The first phrase obviously refers to Jesus' first coming. The second phrase is the requirement before his glorious return. And, um, the, but the key word in this with regard to what we're talking about this morning is the word until. He's, he went back to his place from where he came, and he's going to stay there until a certain thing happens before he comes back. And that certain thing that must happen is they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. That is uh, a prophecy that says he will, not, he will stay at his place until the leadership of the nation of Israel overturn the decision they made when he came the first time that he, and they rejected his claim to be God's son, the Messiah. They're going to have to repent of that and change their minds and admit it and confess it. And then the third phrase in their affliction, they will in their affliction they will earnestly seek me. It says when that's going to happen. That's going to be at the very end of the period, the seven-year period we call the Great Tribulation. So uh, he's he he came. He died on the cross. He was raised from the dead. He appeared to these witnesses for forty days and forty nights, and he went back to his place. And this says he's staying there until the nation of Israel repents. And that has not happened yet. Therefore, he has not come back. Therefore, there can be no apostles. John was the very last one. Now, all of this simply says that uh, apostle was indeed a temporary sign gift. And uh, what that does is that opens the door for other gifts to be temporary as well. So those who believe that sign gifts are indeed temporary don't deny that God still works signs and wonders. He does. He just doesn't do them at the hands of gifted individuals. So uh, that's what I wanted to say about that particular gift. And uh, next question I'd like to answer is, how do you know you even have a gift? Uh, well, we've been showing you the Bible that says you do. So if you believe the Bible and you believe these two particular verses, 1 Corinthians 12, 7 and 1 Peter 4, 10, you have a spiritual gift. But again, this only applies to members of the universal church. If you have believed the gospel of Jesus Christ, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, you have a spiritual gift. So how do you determine what that gift is? That's really the big question when we talk about spiritual gifts. Well, sadly, there's no blood test you can take to tell you which gift you have. Uh, simply, uh, it's, it's to determine really what your interests are as a believer. There are little tests you can take that have been created, uh, quizzes you can answer that will sort of graph for you your likes and your dislikes. If you answer the questions honestly, it'll give you an indication of where your interests are, and uh, that's also an indication of how you're gifted. But if you're not sure, then trial and error is simply the best way. And uh, uh, in this trial and error, then the two things you would use to determine whether or not you have a gift is your effectiveness in the ministry of that gift and uh, your desires. Those are the two best indicators of how you are gifted, spiritually speaking. Now, how much emphasis should be given to these gifts? Uh, is it the only thing we are to do? Of course not. All the commands that we've been given as believers in Christ that are not tied directly to spiritual gifts, we're still commanded to do those things. And um, uh, we will get credit... We will get credit when we stand before Christ at the judgment for those things that are done outside the realm of our spiritual gift. But the, but the primary thing that I want to convey this morning is these spiritual gifts are to be the primary 
or the, should be the center or the focus of the things we do as believers in our Christian in our Christian lives. It should be the primary thing. Now, is there a downside to not knowing what your gift is? Well, yes, there is. If your spiritual gift is not the primary reason you do the things that you do, there's going to be a gap. There's going to be a gap between your activities and whatever it is God's design is for you. Not to mention, not to mention a strong lack of significance and accomplishment in your life. In other words, how, how do I know that when I stand before God at judgment that I'm going to be able to not be ashamed? How do, how do I know that my life is going to account for something? How do I know that it's significant? Uh, we know that when we stand before judgment, there's going to be a test. And the test is going to be fire. And if your activities are burned up as wood, hay, and stubble, you're not going to take it with you. But if they stand the test of fire, then you will take those activities with you. You will get credit for those activities. And those activities will generally, they will be uh, things that you did in faith. But specifically... For your life to count the most, if, they're, if they revolve around the spiritual gift that you have, that you figured out what it is and that you've used it, then uh, you, will, you will have a, uh, a greater sense of accomplishment, a greater sense of significance uh, about this life that you've been given to live here on this earth. Now, what if you don't know? Does it still work? The answer is yes. Uh, the believer, if you're a believer and you're led by the Holy Spirit, guess how he's going to lead you? He's going to lead you to use your spiritual gift, whether you know what a spiritual gift is or whether you don't know what your gift is or you don't even know anything at all about spiritual gifts. Uh, it's simply better if you do know about spiritual gifts. Uh, it's simply better if you, the individual, and the church are taught these truths around spiritual gifts. And saying that, I'm saying that church leaders, church leaders should use this body of truth to help individual believers reach their God-ordained potential. And as a result of that, the church will be much more healthy for it. And in closing, I'm going to uh, quote a phrase that uh, I heard Dwight Edwards say, and I think it is so very true. He said this, the proper use of spiritual gifts allows believers to do the will of God through the gift of God by the Spirit of God for the glory of God. Thank you for your attention. I know you shouldn't be reading text messages in church, but I'm getting a message that says Leo needs to be teaching that this fall. And I think if he gets permission from his wife, maybe he'll have a dispensation where he can do that, possibly this fall. He's taught it in the past, and uh, as you can tell, he's very knowledgeable on the subject. And I think one of the things that Brother Leo just shared here toward the conclusion of the message, the teaching, was the utilization of your spiritual gift is going to create your sense of worth, your sense of... Um, your place in the body of Christ, and it will be acknowledged. And so how that's acknowledged as we stand before the Lord one day, we're going to die, and we're going to appear before the Lord. If you know Jesus, you're going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And at that judgment, it is not a judgment based uh, uh, on your salvation. You already know Jesus, so you're going to appear there, and you're going to be given reward on the basis of your service, your faithfulness, the utilization of your spiritual gifts, the utilization of what God has given you, and He's going to assess that. That's not to determine whether or not you're going to heaven. You've already made that decision, having believed upon the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, having, having uh, known Jesus Christ and Him knowing you. For those who don't know Jesus, well, the subject of spiritual gifts is really a secondary matter, right? Because you need to settle where you're going to spend forever. I appreciate the recognitions that many of you have given me and praying for me, acknowledging me, acknowledging the loss of uh, my brother this week. I'd really appreciate that. Back in January, before he had multiple bypass surgery, 
I sat down with him and I said, brother, we need to talk about the Lord. And I wanted to make sure that he understood the gospel, that he believed the gospel, and that he had had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. And he assured me that he did. And I won't go into all those details, but I wanted to make sure because he was about to experience what we knew to be bypass surgery. We didn't know it would be six bypasses. And we certainly didn't know that he would pass away so quickly, having had a very successful bypass surgery. My point is this. We're going to die. I don't want to be gloom and doom, but you need to know Jesus. You need to know him. You need to confess the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. When you make that decision, this glorious thing happens that you are born again. And you come into this relationship with him that will carry you throughout eternity. It's forever sealed. It's sealed. Your salvation is forever and ever. I mean, it's a guarantee. Because your salvation is based upon what he did, not what you did. Having confessed Jesus Christ as your Savior, then you begin to understand. I'll never forget this, Brother Leo. My first experience with spiritual gifts was this. And... um, I, was, I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ, didn't know much. You, many of you know my testimony, but I went to church with my neighbor after having gone back to the church that I attended for most of my life and realized I don't need to be here anymore. So I got back on my motorcycle, went back home, and my neighbor, I said, where do you go to church? He took me to church. I went there. The pastor said, very early on, he said, there's going to be a class on spiritual gifts. Well, I just thought, It was going to be that Sunday afternoon. The pastor said, come back. And I figured everybody was going to show up. Everybody's going to show up. Because the pastor asked, there's a teaching time. That's what you do, right? Where are the amens? (laughs) I was a teenager. So I roll in there on my motorcycle. I sit down. I realized everybody didn't show up, but that's okay. Don't want to get judgmental here early on in my Christian relationship. But I sat down. He taught on spiritual gifts, and, and, and much, it, it, much like Leo did this morning. And, and, and to be honest with you, as a new believer, it was just like, whew, 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 whew. I don't know what's been said, but... The pastor taught from the Word of God and said, I have a spiritual gift that he gave me. And I listened to some of the definitions, and it was really, took me, I couldn't comprehend it. But he said, you know, maybe some of you had a gift of service. And I thought, well, maybe that's me. I have the gift of service. I didn't really understand a lot about it. And they announced that there was a lady in church who needed her house painted. And I figured, well, I'm capable of doing that. So I showed up to help paint her house. I've got the gift of service. So I showed up. I didn't know much about spiritual gifts. My my point is this, is that just be faithful to what God's shown you today. You don't have to know everything. But if you step into a class like that, you might understand more in depth and understand certainly what God is doing in the greatest way possible in your life. Not just with one gift, but maybe with many gifts, as Leo taught. Thank you very much. You know, those who teach in our church, we we are grateful for them. Linda Clark has taught in our church. How many years, Miss Linda? 61 years. Come come stand by me, okay? Come stand here. And when you bring your children in, 61 years, I mean, someone said, well, I'll, I'll teach children for six months or a year. Well, great. 61. <laughs> well, but for many, many years, I know when we first came to the ch- uh, church, she was teaching in our children's department, so many faithful teachers. And she has been, and, and Brother Don as well, have been faithful members here for decades. Since, since when? Uh, 1961, 1963. 63. Oh, yeah. I was two years old. <laughs> wow. But it just it sort of gives you a perspective. The kind of faithfulness shown by so many using their gift, and Miss Linda, the reason I bring that up, and I want, I want Kenneth, Kenneth, 
and Tammy, you come and stand by your mom. Kenneth and Tammy here, of course, Kenneth was raised in this church, and Kenneth uh, was a school teacher and was on the search committee that called, that asked us to come in view of a call here, and, and uh, uh, actually Kenneth and Cheryl taught school together in Mesquite, but Kenneth then um, sensed the call to ministry. He came on staff, led worship here, for, for many of you who are new, led worship and worked in children's ministry, a very interesting combination. And then some mega church in <laughs> Louisiana. Well, it was a growing church. It's a big church now. And they have more children than we have here this morning uh, in total attendance. But uh, he's been serving on the staff at North Monroe Baptist Church now for 17 years. I know it was just ab about Rita because I remember you bailed on us during Rita because <laughs> you got called to another state. Yeah. And Tammy, his faithful wife. And I want the girls to come and because they were born here, but they're, they're Louisiana girls now teaching, educated girls. And I'm calling them all up here because Miss Linda is, uh, she's going to move closer and Brother Don are going to move closer to Kenneth and Tammy there. And, and I just don't want her to leave without her seeing her church family loving her. Amen? Amen. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Woo. Praise God. You are so you are so loved. You are so loved. And I want to close the service out by praying for her. You come by and hug her neck. And um, this is one of these bitter, sweet moments. It just is. As long as I've been your pastor, the church is changing, but you're here on the shoulders of many faithful people, and let's not forget that, okay? Father God, we thank you for, we thank you for Linda. We thank you for her faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, that you have already made a place for her. You're caring for her, and that you have provided. You have. You've, you just, you've, you're smoothing out the rough places. And we pray for Brother Don, too, God. I know this is not easy for him. And just this time of change, Lord God, um, his health. We ask, God, that in this transition, in this moment, that you will find a place there in Monroe with Kenneth and Tammy and the girls and just in, 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 a, in a church family, Lord, that she will be welcomed and loved and she'll know that she is of great value to you because you created her in your image because you used her in her giftedness in the life of your church bless her lord god as she follows you in this new chapter of her life in jesus name amen god bless you guys amen amen love you